Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this mini series in the factory, Design a Product With Us, where we design a product from scratch before your very eyes. We are designing the Picadev servo driver. If you recall from the last episode, we assembled and drove our prototype PCBs with the Hello World code that we developed earlier in the series. Between now and then, I've actually made some significant upgrades to the hardware design in preparation for production. So in this episode, I'll walk you through the experiments that I did to decide on whether to upgrade or not. We upgraded from three channels to four channels, ran a bunch of experiments to see if that was like a responsible thing to do with the amount of power that we could drive with this unit, included a bunch of features and artwork on the PCB, and it is now ready for analyzing. This is the design as it stands. You can see we have some beautiful silk fonts here. We've squeezed in a fourth channel. There's an address switch and we have a breakout header. So this is a lot more general purpose and maker appropriate. Join me after the intro to see how we arrived at this upgraded design. Okay, so this new design features the fourth channel. In the last episode, I was kind of, I was like, oh, four channels, it might be a bit too much, but we decided to go for it because it'd kind of be rude not to, right? To give people the option. We also recognize that you might be driving these smaller servos, which don't draw as much current. And so having four channels could be a real enabler. And then it's just up to how much torque your servos are delivering, how many there are, there are and how powerful they are. A lot of the last episode was spent fixing the fact that I didn't have an address switch on the prototype. I've opted for a two pole J lead address switch for a couple of reasons. Space, it actually fits on the board. Uh, two poles will give you four addressable options, which I think is ample for the servo driver. Even though you could go as high as six switches, it's starting to get a bit silly and we already have this part. It's great to reuse parts. They're already on the machine. We already stock manage them. So I think two poles is the sweet spot for the servo driver. That will mean you have a maximum of 16 servos connected to your Picadev project before we get into like muxing the I2C bus or anything like that. Now, the eagle eyed among you might realize that I have regressed this three pin header to the non-rotationally symmetric footprint. In one of the previous episodes, I created that symmetrical footprint so that if we wind up not being able to get this part and actually have pin one on the other side, it won't matter. We can still put the part down. But to get this fourth channel in, I've kind of squeezed them all together. You can see they're actually overlapping each other. If on the courtyards layer, you can see the courtyards overlap by quite a bit. And like, that's not a big deal. You just get some warnings when you run the design rule checker. But these are pretty conservative and I can see that they're gonna place just fine. Now, if you're familiar with KiCad, you might be looking at the text on the board and thinking, this text looks pretty good. And this all comes from an open source plugin called KeyBuzzard that we just love to use for its beautiful silk labels. So rather than using the text tool to enter some text and just having this like very, you know, very kind of flat, un uninspiring font. We can use this plugin tool here to create labels. And you can see the, the render preview. You can even install your own fonts. I quite like the Fredoka one that's built in. And this just makes much more appealing uh, artwork for your PCB. So keep that in mind. If you want to edit it though, you can't edit it like a normal uh, KiCad text element. You have to actually select what is now a virtual footprint and click the uh, key buzzard plugin box, but it will pull up that text box that you've selected. It will pull up that text element. And this has just been a game changer for making attractive designs. We spent a bit of time rewriting the board, managing these power rails. And I think everything is just looking a lot nicer and a lot more considered and we're ready to panelize it. But before we do, I'll walk you through the experiments that I ran to get to this point. So I set up an experiment with the servo driver being powered by the Odiarc. The Odiarc is like a power characterization tool. It will supply power to your project and also analyze that power. So you'll get plots of voltage, current, etc. So here I set up an experiment. We've got the Pico W connected to the servo driver and we've got a server connected to that servo driver. 
Everything's being powered by the Otti arc. It's supplying the five volt power to the servo driver. And these other two wires are just some voltage sense wires. So we get the voltage on the board rather than through any voltage drop in the leads. So I set this up, I ran some code to drive the servo back and forth a few times and we get the following plots. I basically wanted to get a vibe check on the project. We just wanna really look at the current and the sense plus voltage. So up the top here, we have current and these peaks are at about 2.5 amps, which is pretty, you know, it's pretty serious for just one server. Remember, we could potentially connect four servers. These graphs are pulsing because the server is being driven back and forward. If I zoom in on one of these, on one of these pulses, this is the moment where the server is being told to drive. We've got some stall current. And then as the server gets up to speed, it's drawing less and less current until it reaches a constant velocity and then turns off. And in fact, this code is driving the server quickly enough that it never comes to rest. So on the next pulse, it has to resist the motion of the motor to, to move backwards and forwards. So we can see we have some pretty serious peaks up around 2.5 amps and the vSense, we're getting a drop of up to half a volt for that stall current, which isn't really surprising. And so I thought, hey, we've got like a capacitor on board. Let's just chuck on a 220 mic capacitor additionally. So a big through hole component just to see what happens. And I'll also put on a 100 nanofarad cap right across the terminals of that servo just to see how we go. Uh, once I introduced that large reservoir cap, it, it basically didn't make any difference. Here you can see the two plots and I've overlaid them over each other. There might be like some small offsets, but you can see these peaks are about the same height, which is no surprise for the current. I mean, it takes a lot of energy to drive the motor, but as well in this voltage plot, the voltage dips go to about the same point as well. And so it got me thinking, you know, I've got this reservoir cap. It's not really doing anything. Like it takes so much energy to run a motor that like a, a, a tiny little 47 mic cap, it, the energy in it is just gonna evaporate instantly. Now I re-ran these tests with a 9G server, you know, these, you know, these little hobby servers that you often see in like remote control airplane. And this is, this is like pretty pleasing to see actually. The 9G servo with no capacitance, no nothing. Uh, this is on like a purely naked board where I've actually removed the reservoir cap. This guy is only getting up to peak around 800 milliamps. And that's a lot more appropriate for a four channel servo driver. And just for completeness, I re-ran that same experiment with the 220 mic and 100 nanofarad cap and the, the current waveforms look exactly the same, which is no real surprise. What, what's really interesting are the oscilloscope captures. So here we have the, the big servo with lots of capacitance, and we get a dip on the scope, you know, much higher bandwidth measurement. We get a dip on the scope of like nearly a volt, about a volt. Here's the same again with no caps, and we get exactly the same response. After doing a few more experiments, looking at noise on the power lines, I just decided to remove the caps entirely, which is great. You know, the, the project still works and we have a simpler board for it. It's one less component that we have to load onto the reels, stock manage, assemble, test, etc. So we've upgraded our board, we're at our production version. And that just brings us to panelization. This is, uh, this is another Picadev module, the RFID module. And you, you don't just assemble a module like this as a single PCB that would be really difficult to, just even handling something like this to assemble it would be quite difficult. So instead, for production, you tile this PCB in what's called a panel. So here we have a panel of 27 units all together, and this is a much more manageable size for machines. Panels have features like these rails that can ride on conveyor belts in a, an assembly line. So this whole panel can go into a machine we assemble 27 at the same time, goes through the oven, and then at the other end, we just break it apart or depanel it. When we started doing this a couple of years ago, I had to actually hand make these panels by copying and pasting the design or tiling it as an array and hand drawing this uh, panel framework. 
because KiCad just didn't have a built-in tool. Now, of course, KiCad is open source software and has documentation on how to create plugins. So the open source community, being what it is, a very industrious user by the name of Ian put together Kikit, which is a KiCad plugin that generates PCB panels. And I got to tell you, without, without this project, we would have spent just dozens more hours on what is a pretty mundane task to have to do at the end of your project, the panelization. If, if you're watching Jan, we love you, we appreciate you. Kikit is amazing. So we start a panel with an empty PCB project and run the panelize plugin, the Kikit plugin. We select our input file and we can begin. Now, if we just have zero for these spacing parameters, let's just start with a two by two panel just to see what things look like. I'll just enter two by two. Can we hit panelize? Need to make sure that we're very concise with our data entry. Okay, so that is a two by two panel with no space between components. You can see that Kikit has actually changed the names of these nets so that you don't have ERC problems. You actually have unique nets for every single board. And that way there's no like nets not connected to net problems. All right, let's work on some other features. We're still in two by two, but let's introduce some space. We'll put in a three millimeter gap horizontally and vertically. And now our units have slid apart just a little bit. And you can see we actually have automatically generated some tabs from Kikit, which are quite naively placed, but I mean, cool, this is all just defaults. So far, so good. We'll build this panel out little by little to get to the full size. I just wanna show you each of these features in turn. Tabs kinda suck, because you have to break them off. Rather, it's a lot nicer to use a backbone. A backbone is this feature here, where you see how this unit connects to this unit, but not through a tab, it's actually through a backbone that connects to every other unit. This way you get like a, a, a stiffness cross coupling between these strips. It also means there's fewer unique things to break off by hand. And that's like a non-trivial part of the depaneling process, it's just snapping off all the tabs. You can imagine if you made a thousand of these things, you've got to process like maybe two, four tabs per unit. It's no joke. So let's increase the horizontal space by, let's increase, we want 2.5 plus 2.5 plus three is eight millimeters. Let's make the horizontal space eight millimeters and put in a three millimeter vertical backbone. We've sacrificed a little bit of density, but we have this vertical backbone that couples the, the modules together. The reason I'm putting in a vertical backbone that runs this way is because it will keep the board nice and stiff about this axis so that it doesn't sag in the conveyor belt. As this material heats up, it actually does soften a little. The resin will soften and the weight of the components included as well, if there are heavy parts, can make the board bow in the oven. Having this backbone that goes across the conveyor rather than along the conveyor will help with that stiffness. So this is a great start. Let's fix the tabs next. If we select fixed tabs, we can choose the number of tabs per side. So I want one tab vertically and one tab horizontally. And let's just make these 12 millimeters for each. Click panelize again. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Now we have just a single point of contact on each edge. I'll select the edge cuts layer to make things a little more clear. I'm gonna bring the panel to its full width now. So I'll increase, the, I'll increase the number of rows to three. That will be our full width. Hit panelize. And this is where we're going to add these rails, these top and bottom rails that will bring the panel out to its full width. I can use the measure tool and go from edge to edge. And we have 162 millimeters and I want 190. So I'm gonna to go to framing, rails, top, bottom. I think we want a space of 2.5 millimeters and a width. The width is the variable here to bring us out to our 190, 11.5 millimeters. I'm also going to include a three millimeter chamfer. Let's see what this looks like. And there it is, we have a panel that is exactly 190 millimeters 
wide. And now we can just tile this out to the full length, nine columns. This is why I was doing this with a much smaller number before. It takes significantly longer to panelize more units. Hmm. I can see here that I have these single tabs that's still joining the modules together. Perhaps it would be better to have no tabs joining the modules and have two tabs on the backbone. That way there's still just one thing to snap. So we have vertical count zero, horizontal count two. Now you might have seen some artifacts in previous shots as I was panelizing. But once you run the post processing, which is what basically sets the minimum mill radius to give you these like curved tool paths, those artifacts go away. So here's the panel as it stands currently. And we are so very close. You might notice that these end units are just kind of like dangling out here, flapping in the breeze. They're only supported by a backbone on one side. And so really we ought to be using the frame type instead of the rails top bottom framing type. If we change this to frame and leave all those parameters the same, repanelize, we ought to get a nice end tab on this side of the panel. There's our panel and it's even the right size. How nice. Now for the V cuts. We want V cuts and we want them on the edge cuts layer. That's what our manufacturer prefers. You can see now Kikit has inserted all of these edge cut lines and they're even all annotated for the manufacturer. It's even put in these two additional cuts to allow the top and bottom rails of that frame to be snapped off. Now, of course, the reason we do all this is so if there's a design upgrade that we make to the part, then we don't need to reinvent the panel. We can just copy and paste these parameters straight in and we get exactly the same panel as a previous revision. And that also means that if no parts moved around, we use the same stencil as well. Everything is deterministic and still in exactly the same place. And so in that little time lapse, you just saw me add a few features like the uh, tooling holes and fiducials. These are just for manufacturing and assembly, basically. The fiducials are the optical alignment. So the pick and place machine and the stencil machine can find where the panel is in space. There's always three of them on our, on our panels. Because if you load the thing in backwards, it'll go looking for that fiducial and it won't find it. And it'll let you know that there's a problem. So that's just like a little bit of a built-in error checking. And tooling holes, we don't really use them, but they're just there because it's a bit of a convention and it might be useful for something later on. I'm doing my final check of the panel. I've put on all the metadata. I can see that this fiducial is overlapping the text a little bit, so I'll just move that text. And of course, we don't see any of the geometries here because KiCad won't render all the cutouts when the V cut lines are on the edge cuts layers. You could push those back to another layer to see the beautiful routing, but I'm satisfied seeing it within the PCB editor. And so this is ready for Gerber export to the manufacturer. And so there you have it from prototype to panel. We designed this from the scratch. We started with the schematic. We did the design verification on the prototypes, did some hello world coding. I'm not sure if there's going to be any more installments to this series. Absolutely let me know if you have any questions. If you want to discuss anything, just see us on our forums. What do you want to see out of this series? Do you want to, do you want to see how we put together more of the MicroPython code? Or does that start to feel a bit heavy handed? Let us know. In any case, I think that's a pretty good spot for us to stop in today's episode. We've got a producible panel that we can send to the manufacturer, and then we can start placing some parts. Thanks for joining us for this little product development journey. I hope you've enjoyed, and of course, until next time, thanks for watching.